Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. Book of Revelation. We're going to pick it up in chapter 5, where um, finally somebody was qualified to open the real mystery to the book of life. And uh, the, the one, the, the thing you want to remember, as we covered uh, verse 6, that it was a lamb slain, meaning this happened after the crucifixion. This happened after Christ had been resurrected. And then it should remind you, we've been taken all the way to the Lord's day. And there he stands. But he is able to instruct John to go back to earth and teach us the meanings of the apocalypse and the rest of the word. How gracious he is that he loves his children, that if you will seek, you will find. But seek takes a little doing on your part. It means you've got to exercise the uh, art of studying and of praying for understanding, and then God touches you, and the truth comes forth. It has been released. We got to the um, ninth verse of that fifth chapter. Let's pick it up there as we're about to learn who those seven spirits are of God. Verse 9, and it reads, They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That is to say, if they believe, and only, only if they believe, uh, because he saves believers, not heathen. A heathen is someone that doesn't believe, regardless of what people they come from. What song is this they're singing? It's the song of Moses, of course. It's the song Moses taught, and, and it was for the end times. And that, that's the song they sing, and what a beautiful song it is, and you find that in Deuteronomy 32, verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. When, when is that going to happen? Well, you, you will find it in chapter 20, verse 6. It's in the millennium, the very time that we're taken to here, where it says God's elect will reign with him all that Lord's day, which is a period of 1,000 years. Again, Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 declares. Verse 11, And I beheld, I, I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You couldn't count them. This is the people that had washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, had, had attained salvation, and were already in heaven. Well, I heard there was only a... 144,000 are going to make it. Well, you heard wrong. And you'll find out what those were when we get to the seventh chapter. <clears throat> I mean, there were so many you couldn't count them. Christ is able to save all, all kindred, tongue, people, and nations that will believe. That's why it's so important that you teach the truth, the Word of God so that people have an opportunity to attain that salvation. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive. I want you to listen carefully here. What is it that the lamb receives? Well, it's the seven spirits of God. There is something very important in what we're about to read. There is a polysynetan which is to say the word and added to each of the spirits. 
each of the powers that brings emphasis of importance so that you can't read over it. We start um, by power. That's number one. And, there's, there's your and, riches. That's number two. Rich in truth and the blessings of God that no man can come between you and that light that shines from above. And, polythendeta, wisdom. All wisdom comes from God. You have to pray for it, search for it, and that spirit of, of wisdom will come to you, will bless you. And, there we go again, emphasis, strength. There's nothing like when you're weak, calling upon that strength and, and receiving it. And, honor. And, um, that honor is serving him and having his blessings. What a wonderful thing it is. So there we have power one, riches two, wisdom three, strength four, honor five, and glory six. All the glory goes to God. And he deserves it. And the last, this is seven, blessings. For when you partake of this, that spirit of blessings, it's promised by him that when you serve him and when you participate in the other six, naturally blessings are going to flow. And, and that's, that's the way God operates and how beautiful it is and what a powerful, powerful verse to, to have the emphasis placed on each of the powers and blessings whereby when you claim them, when you live them, then naturally they become a reality and God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. What a beautiful verse that is. And, um, and here it is that um, we have those seven spirits from God that are everything from strength, comfort, love, blessings, and naturally the glory all going to him. Verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessings and honor and glory, reconsidering part, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever, and it is his forever and ever. This is why you want to, if you want to join a party that is eternal, that's it. If you want to get into a situation that has power, honor, and blessings, and strength forever and ever, that's it. You found the correct party. And it is the party of Almighty God as he leads his children and as he blesses those children. It isn't a part-time thing. It's forever and ever. Verse 14, And the four beasts said, Amen. That's that. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Why wouldn't they? He's our Heavenly Father and they were in his presence. And this beautiful truth had poured forth power to open the book, the seals, to understand those seals. And now we come to, in this uh, sixth chapter, these seals. It is important, that, well, where do these seals go? Into your mind. They are, the seals are the teachings of God from the book having been opened, whereby you're not deceived whereby that you know the chronological order of important knowledge. I, I hope you're listening to what I'm saying. I did not say chronological order of time. I said chronological order of important things in their own priorities as you should receive them and tuck them away. The seals are not given in chronological order as far as time is concerned but of importance to you. 
You don't want to miss any of them. And we probably won't even be able to complete all of them in this lecture, but we'll get started with it. Chapter 6, verse 1, the very seals of God as the Lamb breaks the seals and brings the truth forth. And chapter 6, verse 1 reads, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Now, does that say right there, I, I'm, we're going to hide this seal, or we're going to do this behind closed doors? I didn't know what it said. It said, it is open, it is laid out here, you come and see. We're honest, we've got nothing to hide. We're not operating behind closed doors, and it is not an unknown fact. The Lamb of God has opened the seal whereby you can see it. Well, let's take a look at it. Verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now naturally, as, as you should know, this is the Antichrist. Well, I thought it was the Lord Jesus Christ, so did he. That's who he's pretending to be. But... The truth is in the pudding. Do you remember when we were in the fourth chapter around the throne of God, there was this bow? I mean, a prism of color. The Shekinah glory was there. Now here is this one that has a bow also, pretending to be God, showing the world that he is God. <clears throat> As it is written, and we covered in the last lecture, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that, it, Paul promised, it's going to happen. But you see, this word bow in the Greek is toxon. It's a cheap fabric imitation. Just as he is a cheap imitation of Savior. So see that you're never, never deceived. And this is what our Father would ha have you to know from the living word of God. And there he sits. Do you think there is another place in God's word that he has told us from the beginning what these seven seals are? Of course there is. Have you ever read them? We're going to do it. We're going to do it real carefully because in Mark chapter 13, our Heavenly Father gave us each of these seals in order as they are important to your mind to receive them and to act upon them. So open your Bible, hold your place in Revelation. We're going to be going back and forth here. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 13 and we're going to read verses 5 and 6. What did Jesus teach concerning what it would be like when he returned at the second advent, which is exactly where we are in the book of Revelation? Listen to it, verse 5. And Jesus, answering them, began to say, what's it going to be like at the end, was what they asked. Take heed, lest any man deceive you. If he comes riding in on a white pony, that doesn't mean it's me. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, but he's Antichrist, the fake, and shall deceive many. I mean, the whole world's going to whore after him. Why? They haven't read it. They do not know the difference. This is why those two churches that taught the truth concerning this ilk, those that claim to be of our brother Judah and are nothing but the synagogue of Satan, have deceived people. Re returning then to um, chapter 6, the great book of uh, Revelation, and um, we pick it up with verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, well, here it is. I heard the second beast say, come and see. It's not hidden. All you got to do is come and take a look at it. Uh, verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that set their own to take peace from the earth and that they should kill 
one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. That means war. It's a war horse. Okay. You go out to make war. What, well, the, what about uh, Mark? Did, did Jesus teach that in the sermon he gave there? Well, let's go find out. Mark 13, verse 7. Hold your place in Revelation. Mark 13, 7 reads, And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, that's the war horse, no accident, and it isn't just per chance, it's the Word of God. Be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. And it's not. Things have to happen. You've got to keep your eyes open. You are a watchman, and Christ is ripping these seals open. Again, not behind closed doors as some do, but open and honestly, because there's no crooks and there's nothing to hide. It's the word of the living God. So we return then uh, to, um, to Revelation chapter 6, and we pick it up then with, um, with uh, the next verse, which is verse 5. And verse 5 reads, And when he had opened the third seal, that's the third one, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. Look at it here. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And, and so it was that those balances were there. Verse 6, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Do, do you know what the oil and wine are? The oil is the oil of our people, the olive oil that we bless and anoint with. And the wine, of course, is the blood of Christ, symbolically, for the table of the Lord. But um, this has to do with, uh, as you well know, um, uh, uh, hunger. And um, we might say the price of everything, inflation, shoots right out the top. It's coming. Hang on for it. It shall happen. And so it is. And, and so it shall be. Then we go on with verse 7 of Revelation. And when he had opened the fourth seal, here it comes, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. You come and take a look at this. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given to them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword. That's to spiritually make them dead in a hammer if they listen to them. And with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Uh, this is a very important thing and you need to make a note of it in your mind. It's the only place this word beast is utilized in the word of God. The word in the Greek is therion, which is the holding place of uh, fallen angels and, and evil spirits. This is their, their holding place. And it's the only place in the Bible that this word is utilized here in, um, in, in the very word itself. And here we turn then and, and we turn one more time to the great book of Mark. And let's go with it. We go with the next verse in Mark, Mark 13, verse 8. Listen to it. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of the sorrows. That means of the labor pains. These sorrows are labor pains, actually the birth, if you would, of a new age. And so it is. It comes. That's what and this famine is not, as you would read in the great book of Amos, it's not for bread, but it's for hearing the word of God taught properly. 
And then so it is. So you see, these seals were taught to us by Christ even when he walked uh, the earth that we should know and that we should understand. Now, let's return, if we may, back to the great book of Revelation, and we'll pick it up with uh, verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, I want you to see something, and I want you to see it good. These were people that walked the earth and were slain here, shed their blood, because they taught and served the word of God. And, and um, where were they? Out here in some hole in the ground? No, they were under the altar of God because they had overcome. And overcome they did. Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? How long are you going to let it go before the day of vengeance takes place? <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed, delivered up before death, which is to say Satan, as they were, should be fulfilled. Must be fulfilled. Filled. So, on that, let's return, if we may. What, what does it mean? These said, we, God gave them robes, said, you got to sit easy. I've got something your fellow servants, the elect, must do on earth. And um, so we pick it up in verse 9 of Mark 13. He's going to fill you in. Listen to it. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, synhedrians, and in the synagogue, that's the synagogue of Satan, the ones we learned of in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and 3, 9 and 10. You shall be beaten and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. That is to say, for Christ's sake. For a testimony against them. In other words, these are those on earth that must bring forth that testimony in the end times, and they cannot harm one hair on your head, as it's written in Luke 21. Verse 10, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. That's the purpose. That's the reason. Only this is a real special truth of the gospel coming forth, because it's from God's elect. Well, how is it delivered? Verse 11, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand. Don't you try to plan what you're going to say. What ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. Don't even worry about it. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour. Well, what hour is that? The hour of temptation. That speak ye, for it is not you that speak, but the Holy Spirit. That's the way, the real truth. This is why on Pentecost Day, the sons and daughters were delivered up, and they began to, to speak in uh, the, the heavenly language that needed no interpreter. It was not unknown. It's understood in every word. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Not some mumbo-jumbo pie stuff, okay? Verse 12. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father of the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. Delivered up before death, which is to say the Antichrist. Well, why, why would a father do that to his children? Because he thinks he's worshiping Jesus. He's going to say, Jesus, forgive my boy. He thinks he's doing right out there. I want you to forgive him. He's a good boy. Or mother says, this is a good girl out there. Jesus, listen, but it's not Jesus, it's Satan. So they're trying to deliver their own children up and brothers and sisters to the devil himself because of their ignorance of not having studied the seals of God that are not hidden but are unloosed, wide open, not behind closed doors, but given where anyone can understand them. 
Verse 13, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. It's guaranteed. You can count on it. And let's go with the next verse. And the next verse would be 14. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, and let them that be in the Judea flee to the mountains. A little wrong with this translation. You know why? Because when you go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, you find it is not a desolation spoken of there, but the desolator. Not a condition, but an entity. The desolator, of course, is the Antichrist, Satan, standing where he ought not, showing the world that he is God, as Paul taught in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, 5, and 6. And the word, and the Greek has a strange way. The word him, her, and uh, it depends on, it's all one word in the Greek, but it depends on the subject as to whether you or use he or it. In this particular case, it's not a condition desolation, but the desolator, so it should be he, standing where he ought not. Verse 15 to continue. And let him that is on the housetop not go into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. You're not going to need a suitcase, and you're not going to be gone that long. 16, and let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. You won't need a change of clothes. The end has come. 17, but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. What, what, what in the world does that mean? It does not mean that it's a sin for a mother to bear a child. It's talking about the virgin bride of Christ, spiritually speaking, that's supposed to remain a virgin and wait for him. And these people have already jumped in the sack with the false Christ and have been impregnated with his lies and deception. And there are no longer virgins fit for a wedding to the true Christ. He puts this in a language anyone can understand. If, if your husband has been away 2,000 years and he comes back and you're suckling a small child, what does it mean? It means you've been unfaithful, and so it is. <clears throat> 18. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. Why? You don't harvest stuff out of in the winter. Okay. You harvest it in harvest time, meaning you better know the season. 19. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. You know, a lot of people would have you so-called Bible, so Bible scholars would tell you this happened in A.D. 70. Liars. A little tin-horned general named Titus does not bring to pass the greatest thing that's happened since creation. Verse 20. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, chose before the foundations of the earth, he has shortened the days. We'll find out in the ninth chapter, he shortened it to a five-month period over a seven-year period. Verse 21, And then, if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. Why, it's the Antichrist. It's a fake. They're going to be screaming it all over the world. Jesus has returned. It's a fake. He's a cheap fabric imitation. Verse 22, for false Christ and false prophet shall rise. Did Jesus say maybe? No, he said shall. You could, don't let some man deceive you. The false Christ does come first at the sixth trump, which you will learn in this great book of Revelation. The true Christ does not, I repeat, does not return until the seventh trump. How are you fixed for truth? Are you going to be willing to serve God or are you going to serve Satan? It's your choice. Because those false Christ shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. That's how good he is. I mean, he, he is so sharp in bringing forth his lies and his um, deception. Verse 23, 
But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. And so he has. He has foretold us all things whereby you don't really have to worry about anything. When did he foretell us? In this letter. He sent you this letter to prepare you mentally, spiritually, so that you could physically as well be ready to witness and to stand against the false Christ. Well, what am I supposed to say? You just read it. He said, don't even think about it. Don't premeditate what you'll say. And you're not going to be doing the talking. But you do have to be loyal enough. And, and you know what? Inasmuch as he chose you before the foundations of this world, this won't be the first time you stood against Satan. You stood against him in that first earth age, or he would not have chosen you. Because he knows you can cut it. He knows you are can-do type people. He knows that he can trust you. These are the seals of God, as they are given in order of importance to us. Well, why would, why would he put the Antichrist in the first seal? Because that's the most important thing on the Lord's day, to not be deceived. You could, if you're not careful, why is it so important? But if you worship him, you throw away your chances. You throw away your salvation. Well, I thought once saved, always saved. Give me a break. Do you think for a moment you can claim to be saved and then hop in the bed with Satan, worshiping him, and still expect Christ to have you? You can forget it. That, that, it's not going to happen. So once saved, always, the salvation is there as long as you stick to the true Christ. You go with this fake, and you lost it. And uh, God is the judge, and whether you get it back in the Lord's day, that's up to you. That's up to him. But we're going to pick up the rest of these seals in the next lecture. You're living in a precious, wonderful time. It's exciting. It's vivacious. See that you keep up and see that you stay attuned. And these seals are wide open. They're not hidden. So see that you receive them. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's word informs us on all things. Ezekiel, one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, Probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman God, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel. All right, there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. Why? We don't judge people. We have one judge. That's our father. Boy, he can, go, he can get it done. We don't have to worry about judging. But you should discern, have spiritual discernment of who you should fellowship with and who you should not. It's really very simple. You just, you want to fellowship where God's Word is taught, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's, and you want to fellowship with people that teach as the Church of Smyrna, Revelation 2.9, and Philadelphia, Revelation 3.9, teach. Okay. That those are the only two that Christ was pleased with. That becomes very important. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request, you do away with the number and the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. 
He's, he is that light that has contact with you all the time. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you as long as you don't leave him. But you have to want to stay with him also, naturally. And um, that pays great dividends with love, honor, and blessings, giving him the glory. See that you do that. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. Okay, we're going to take um, Mrs. Garcia from uh, Texas. Um, I, uh, Ms. Garcia, I can see that your English is not your, major, your uh, natural language, and uh, I'm going to try to help you here, uh, and I will read your question. I can't find Kasarat in my Bible, or I'm spelling it wrong. I, I can only think that probably you have used C as, as in um, cap, uh, Climeta, and you should use G as in grande, and and um, I think because you, I think you're looking for Genesaret, and it's mentioned many times in the New Testament. If not, you write me again and be real patient with me. I'll figure it out. Uh, Matt from Wisconsin. I also have have a question. It may seem like a dumb question. There's no such thing as a dumb question, okay? But did the Lord place souls in the angel-human hybrid skeebers, I think you call them? I mean, it seems they weren't supposed to exist. You know, God never split souls. And every soul gets, is born into the condition they are because they earned it. God is always fair and equitable. And I'm sure someone said, well, how could he possibly put a soul in a geber? Well, there was a, there was a rebellion by Satan. And many of his people rebelled. That's, they got what they deserved. Well, did they have an opportunity? I feel that every soul, and as much as God does not split souls, every soul ultimately through this time of salvation and the Lord's day. They really love the Father, then that love will be returned, and he is the judge. That makes it pretty nice. Uh, Ray from New Jersey. Uh, Pastor Murray, thanks for you, for you and your staff. You're so welcome. Could you tell me when the Old Testament was complete and passed to the world? Ezra and Nehemiah were given orders to put the t scripture in order pretty well as we have it today in the Old Testament, the Torah. <clears throat> and the Old Testament then was de facto delivered in approximately the completion of Daniel, minor prophets, about the time of the captivity by Nebuchadnezzar and, and the completion thereof, which makes it about 400 B.C. Um, now, if you're talking about the King James, that was 1611 A.D., okay? I'm talking about manuscripts, scripture. Uh, Nani from North Carolina, Noni from North Carolina, could King Saul and the Apostle Saul be related, seeing they were both of the tribe of Benjamin, only in the sense of umbilical cord to umbilical cord, because, because Paul, the um, uh, disciple, was many, many years later, okay? But, but of the same people, naturally. Scott from Michigan. My wife has left me, and I'm really upset for this. I've been reading and studying the Bible and looking for some sort of healing, can you give me some scripture for me to study on? I really don't want a divorce. I know with prayer we can fix this. Well, cover 1 Corinthians chapter 7. That has to do with marriage, but read it with understanding, though, now. I mean, if you uh, can't figure it out yourself, you need my work on that, but be that as it may. Um, when... 
uh, not knowing what the situation is, why the two of you are divorced, I have to be very careful on giving you advice only in the positive sense that if you want her back, how did you get her in the first place? You courted her. Okay. Then I would advise that you do it again. Yeah, I'm saying if you want her back, um, court her again and let her know that you love her and um, we'll, we'll be praying with you. But God's word is complete and you might make a note also of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It might help you considerably. Bob from California. First, I'd like to thank you for your ministry and your sons. You're so very welcome. How, my, now my question, what is the difference between an angel and an archangel? Thank you and God bless. Angels are, must pass through this earth age. They must be born of woman to, at one time or the other. Okay. An angel simply is a person in their spiritual body, a fellow servant. An archangel will never be born to woman. They are of a, uh, they, they earn their right to be called archangels from the first earth age. Naturally, I do not know what that was, but it, you don't have to, it's pretty obvious that at Satan's rebellion, they earned that right, and it's pretty obvious what that would be. God can trust them. As a matter of fact, he put them in charge, Michael in charge of, of, uh, of, chaining Satan until he's cast out on this earth as, as the false Christ. An archangel is never born to a woman. They're, they have already overcome, and that's it. Jacob from Mississippi. My question, the unbeliever who goes like a drop of fat on the Barbie grill and goes up in smoke, is that the end, or do they suffer forever and ever? It's the end. It's just smoke. Um, what, what he's quoting is the, um, the acrostic that's given in the Hebrew manuscripts in Psalms 37, where the question was asked, why does it seem like the wicked are al always get ahead and are always blessed? And this acrostic, you, you with Companion Bibles, your 37th Psalm will give you the particular lines of the song that stand aside. And there are three verses in that psalm that let you know, don't worry about those that sin and it appears they get ahead. Why? Because in the middle verse, they're going to be like lamb on a spit as the fat drops into the fire and goes up in smoke forever and ever. They don't exist anymore. They're blotted out. The third part of it is, is that you that do what's right are going to be there to witness it. Answer to the question, does wickedness get away with anything? No, it goes up in smoke. Okay, so end of story, forever and ever. Uh, Judy from West Virginia, would it be wrong, question, would it be wrong to anoint yourself several times if you are having health problems? I live alone and anoint myself. I don't want to do anything wrong in the eyes of the Lord. There's nothing, nothing wrong with anointing yourself and even by yourself because you're not really alone. He's with you. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And always anoint yourself in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, ask that healing or whatever it is that you need, and his blessing. And he's, he wants you to, as it's written in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26, remind me of my promises. You talk to me about them and so that we can uh, talk about them and I can justify you. Okay? So you bet. It's fine to talk with him to anoint yourself. Uh, Nikia from Wisconsin. When a person dies, can another person come back and save them? No. Unless you want to say that person could be the Lord Jesus Christ if they are with him. To be absent from this body is to be with God. 
But if you're thinking about coming back in the flesh, no, that cannot be. Um, you can pray for someone that has passed away if you want to. I do not know what good it would do unless you have a lot of influence with our Heavenly Father. But they have each person must enter for their own sins. We do have intercessory prayer for help for someone to be given the truth whereby they can correct their own ways. But basically, when you get right down where the rubber meets the road, every entity must repent of their own sins. You can only intercede in as much as you pray that God will give them knowledge and wisdom and change their heart and mind, whereby they will repent, okay? Uh, and, you know, um, Nikia, we have the Lord's Day coming. And people that didn't have an opportunity to know are going to be taught. That's why even in today's lecture, it said you made us kings and priests, or you made us priests with you. And as I stated in Revelation 20, verse 6, they reign with Christ for a thousand years. Reigning meaning preaching, trying to get people to see the truth. Many will. Debbie from California I am thankful for your TV program because it helps me to understand the Bible and God's Word much better. My question is, I am not very smart. I'm, I mean, I have a lot of trouble understanding and reading the Bible, so I get up and sit with myself because I do not understand everything I read. Is it okay for me to go, to go in my heart and what has... I, whatever I feel to to watch your program, of course it is. You know, you're, this is a church, and we are a Bible teaching church. For the teaching and understanding of God's word is is much eye, uh, eyes for me to know God's word. Does does it mean that I t uh, turn? It, it is fine. We have many people that um, are of one language or the other, and this is why I try to be patient in certain translations. But you, you are, you relax. You're a daughter of the living God. And I don't care when you're in a house coat or whatever you are, if you want to study God's word. And I, I think you're very intelligent, okay? Why? Why can I say that? Because all wisdom comes from God, and you're thirsting for what God has for you. It's wisdom. You keep studying. I'm proud of you. You're doing good. Linda from... Linda, I don't know where Linda is from. Would you tell me where it is in the Bible? He did not come to change God's laws and to read all my... I've read all my Bible, all the way from page one to the end. I can't find it. Matthew chapter five, verse 17. Matthew verse five, chapter 17. That's Christ teaching, Christ speaking. He didn't come to change the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew five seventeen. Uh, Linda from Kentucky. I enjoy the teaching of God's word with you very much. Thank you. I have a question about my daughter-in-law. She passed away on 92510. My son, her husband, passed away on 52108. Well, we, we, we uh, know they are with the Lord, okay? So we can rejoice in that. But I know it brings much grief to the mothers. And you just thank God that you know where they are. My question is her autopsy report. Well, I, I, don't, I won't go into that, but God is judge. Man makes many mistakes sometimes on reports and so forth. So uh, you know her heart. God knows her heart. And we have the millennium to help those that need help. All right? You just uh, thank God and, and uh, rejoice. Rita from Las Vegas. Pastor, I don't understand the scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Well, what does it say? It says in verse 13 and 14, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen about those that, if you believe that Christ rose from the dead, 
then you better know that those that are asleep or dead have risen also. They're already gone. They're already with him. Read it carefully. And then it says that at the last trump, that's the seventh, not the sixth. That's when the Antichrist comes. But at the seventh trump, Christ returns to this earth, and we are all changed into the word air there is breath of life, spiritual bodies, to be with the Lord forever and ever. And that's all it means. It's, it, it will go on to say, colon, no way can we who are alive and remain precede those that are dead. Why? They're already gone. They, they go first. Well, how do they go first? Why, why do they go first? Because they're already there. They're already out of here. It's that simple, okay? This is why Paul wrote the Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. He said, I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Christ. Don't let that first letter I wrote deceive you or any spirit. We're not gathering back to Christ until after the Antichrist appears, okay? Read Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, all over again, and it'll help you out, starting with verse 1. James from Illinois, we both know that our father didn't create evil or even the knowledge of evil, and yet evil was in the Garden of Eden. So could the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was full of the knowledge of good and evil, be evil left over from the first earth age where one-third of, well, of course it was. Why? Because who is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It's Satan. Who's the tree of life? It's Christ. Who is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Satan. And naturally that evil happened in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, when he fell. Diana from Arizona, please explain how God determines what spirit soul from the first earth age he gives the Kenite. God's elect can be evil or good as Esau and Jacob to serve his purpose, correct? It, God, we are born with the soul that we deserve, okay? And I don't have any doubt about that because God is always fair and equitable, okay? You, you, you uh, are what you are. It's just like his judgment will be the same way. You're going to get everything you got coming to you at judgment. That is, for God's elect, it's, it's rewards. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's gifts for eternal life. But for the wicked, it's a trip to the hot lake, okay? But every, everybody, when they're born, we had an earth age before this. Uh, you might say, well, how can you say that? Well, look at Esau. God loved Jacob and God hated Esau while they were still in their mother's womb. How possibly could God hate a little embryo in a mother's womb? He didn't hate the embryo in the mother's womb, but the soul of the person he put in it, Esau, because he didn't care any one whit about our father or his heritage. Have you ever seen a child like that and couldn't care less about their mom and dad and what they had or if they were happy or just pew, they're out, gone, away from me and to heck with everybody else? That was Esau. Uh, God doesn't operate that. He's family. And family should love each other. And so uh, that, that's why that God places souls and you, you get what you deserve. But the main thing is, the beauty is, I don't care, if, even if you're a Kenite, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on him, you're a child of God and you have salvation waiting for you. That's the greatness and the glory be to Almighty God himself that makes these things possible for us. Freddie from Mississippi, question. Where in the Bible is Scripture confirming that Cain and Abel were twins? I have looked and I cannot find it. Also, do you think we need to be... Um, you can be... Uh, when you are baptized in the name of Yahshua, Yahshua means Yahweh and, or Jesus. It means Yahweh and His Savior. So He is the Father and the Son, and wherever they are, so is the Holy Spirit. Now, the question about... Uh, Cain and Abel, you need to take 
chapter 4 in Genesis, verse 1, where Adam knew his wife and she was impregnated. But then back up to chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, and a little before that, and she was already impregnated. According to Jesus Christ's teachings in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, by somebody else. Then you can better understand when you read verse 2. Listen carefully now. And where it says, and, and again, check that word again out in the Hebrew, and you'll find it's continued. Continued in what? Labor. She continued in labor and gave birth to Abel, meaning they were twins. Uh, which, which is no biggie, but that's the way it was. That's what it says. Um, no name needed. Where in the Bible does it say that it is okay to separate yourself from those who repeatedly use, abuse, and or mistreat you? I do try to practice forgiveness, but at what point am I just being foolish or stupid? Should we even forgive the mean spiritual, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So is it not okay to remember this wrong? Of course it is. You, you've got that part right. Now, what do you do, though? You go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and begin reading at verse 6. And it will tell you, don't treat them as an enemy. But do put them to the side and, and exhort them. You, you give, try to give them an attitude adjustment. And, and so it is. And I'm out of time. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. We're out of time. I love you. God loves you because you enjoy the word. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. But you know what's most important? You listen to me and listen good now. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our, our Father's Word, how precious it is. We're going to get back into it here in chapter 7, verse 21 of the great book of Deuteronomy. At the law given by Moses, the fifth book in the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy is, and a lot of people call it the second law. There's no such thing as the second law. He's repeating the law in layman's terms, I like to, that's my words, but I think that captures it real well. He brings it 